Grammar Girl is brought to you by Babbel, the top-selling language learning app in the world. Babbel will get you speaking your new language within weeks through their proven teaching method and lessons created by real people. Choose from 14 languages, including Spanish, French, and Polish. To try Babbel free, go to babbel.com or download the app today. That's babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L, dot com or download the free app. Babbel, speak a new language with confidence. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. Today, I have a quick and dirty tip about the word racket. Another quick and dirty tip about how to spell bureaucracy. I promise you'll never get it wrong again. A meaty middle about winter storm words, and a couple of kitchen table lingo stories at the end. Let's get started. The game of racquetball has an unusual spelling that looks vaguely French, but actually isn't. Racquetball players may suffer from confusion about what to call the implement they use to bang a ball about when they play. What they hold is known as a racket with a K in the middle of the spelling, or a racket with a Q-U in the middle. Players are probably safe using either spelling, but most sources consider racket with the Q-U to be a variant, especially outside a racquetball court. The word racquetball, spelled with the Q-U, is celebrating its 50th birthday this year. But the game of rackets involving hitting a ball about in an enclosed area is more than 500 years old. Chaucer compares playing racket to and fro to falling in and out of love in Troilus and Cressida. The word raquest, and I don't know if I'm saying that right, it's R-A-Q-U-E-C-T-E, shows up in France in the 15th century. And the earlier English references could be to a game using the hand rather than an implement for striking the ball. There's an earlier Arabic word, raha, R-A-H-A-H, for palm of the hand. The Q-U spelling for racket first appears in the Oxford English Dictionary Corpus in 1709 in relation to a lacrosse stick. Lacrosse, meaning the stick, is French. The racket with a Q-U spelling for a game or implement seems to be a North American invention, later used in reference to rackets as played in England. Rackets, which involved hitting a ball against a wall rather than over a net, evolved into squash. Racquetball evolved from a similar game called paddleball, which was originally played by tennis players at the University of Michigan around 1930. They practiced indoors on squash courts when the weather was bad, substituting ping-pong paddles for their tennis rackets and then a hard rubber ball for the fuzzy tennis ball. In 1949, a tennis pro named Joe Sobeck added strings back into the paddle and came up with the rules for what he called paddle rackets. In 1969, at the sport's first large tournament in St. Louis, competitors decided on one prominent player's suggestion to call the sport racquetball, and the International Racquetball Association was formed, spelled with a Q-U. That spelling of racket is well established, even if there's little logic or history behind it. The Associated Press style book prefers the racket spelling with a K, and Merriam-Webster's Unabridged Dictionary and the American Heritage Dictionary both call racket with a Q-U a variant spelling of racket with a K. The game returned to England in 1976, but played on a squash court with a different ball and some different rules. It was called racquetball with a K, but in 2016, the World Squash Federation decided to rebrand the game as Squash 57, referring to the 57 millimeter diameter of the ball, which is the same size as its American cousin, but bigger than a 40 millimeter squash ball. Their hope is to eliminate confusion of that game with the different, mostly North American game of racquetball, spelled with a Q-U. There are a few other meanings of racket spelled with a K, the most common being a loud din or commotion, and a dishonest way of making money. We don't know the origin of those senses, but the noisy and disorderly meaning first appeared in the mid-16th century. 
It could be from a Scottish word, ricade, meaning noise. That segment was written by Mark Allen, who is a freelance copy editor based in Columbus, Ohio. Follow him on Twitter at Editor Mark, and that's Mark with a K. Next, I promise to help you spell the word bureaucracy. I've been interviewing authors for the podcast lately, and one question we always ask is what words give them trouble? And I think more than half of the authors, successful and in many cases New York Times best-selling authors, more than half of the authors say they can't spell bureaucracy. So if you struggle with it, don't feel bad. You're not alone. It's just a tough word. First, let's stipulate that most people don't have a problem with the crossy part at the end. We're familiar with that from democracy, theocracy, and so on. So we need help with the bureau part. If you trace it all the way back to Latin, bureau shares a root with burrow, the donkey. Weird, right? Well, the relationship is a little convoluted, so I won't go into it for our purposes. But it's easy to imagine that a bureaucrat not helping you from behind a desk is a stubborn donkey, a stubborn burrow who won't help you. And burrow is a lot easier to spell. B-U-R-R-O. Now imagine that donkey not only stubbornly not helping you, but also putting on perfume while ignoring you and not helping you. A stubborn burrow putting perfume behind its ears. Oh, de obstruction. How rude. Now, this part might be a little tougher, but anyone who has shopped for perfume should have encountered phrases like eau de toilette and eau de cologne. The spelling of that O part is what's in the middle of bureaucracy. So imagine a stubborn burrow dotting perfume behind its ears and take the burr part from burrow, B-U-R, and the O part from O de obstruction, E-A-U, Add a crossy on the end, and you have bureaucracy. It may seem silly, I know it does, but I used to never be able to spell this word, and I've gotten it right every time since I came up with that little story, so I hope it helps you too. Before we get to storm words, if you're a parent, thinking of becoming one, or just want to laugh alongside two new parents, here's a new podcast for you. It's called Josie and Johnny Are Having a Baby with You, and it's part of the Stitcher Network of Podcasts. The podcast follows comedians Josie Long and Johnny Donahoe through their not-totally-planned pregnancy as they prepare for the birth of their first child. Luckily, they have a network of friends to help them figure things out, including entertainers like John Hodgman, Eugene Merman, Rachel Sklar, and Jane Marie. You'll hear conversations about everything from how to deal with not getting enough sleep to how to cope with the mental health issues that sometimes come with new parenthood. Check out the show to hear more. Subscribe to Josie and Johnny are having a baby with you in your favorite podcast app. And Grammar Girl is also sponsored by Robinhood, an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, and cryptos, all commission-free. While other brokerages charge up to $10 for every trade, Robinhood doesn't charge any commission fees, so you can trade stocks and keep all of your profits. There's no account minimum deposit needed to get started, so you can start investing at any level. The simple, intuitive design of Robinhood makes investing easy for newcomers and experts alike. View straightforward charts and market data and place a trade in just four taps on your smartphone. You can also view stock collections such as 100 Most Popular. With Robinhood, you can learn how to invest in the market as you build your portfolio. Discover new stocks, track your favorite companies, and get custom notifications for price movements so you never miss the right moment to invest. Robinhood is giving Grammar Girl listeners a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help build your portfolio. Sign up at grammar.robinhood.com. That's grammar.robinhood.com. And now, on to winter words. The Midwestern United States was hit in January by some of the coldest weather in decades. 
In Buffalo, North Dakota, and Chicago, Illinois, wind chill temperatures fell to minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit. In Ponsford, Minnesota, it reached minus 66. Schools closed, the Postal Service suspended mail, and people were warned to avoid taking deep breaths so the cold air wouldn't hurt their lungs. With all that in mind, today we're going to talk about some weird words we use for winter weather. Some of them you've heard before, but others may be new. Let's start with what we just faced, a polar vortex. A polar vortex sounds dramatic, but it's actually nothing more than a large area of cold, low-pressure air. One surrounds the North Pole, another the South Pole. The vortexes are always there, but they get weaker in the summer and stronger in the winter. That strengthening means they expand. In the Northern Hemisphere, the polar vortex dips down into the jet stream, a westerly flow of air that circles the globe. The jet stream pulls the frigid air down, and voila! The temperature in the northern United States can suddenly be the same as the temperature at the North Pole. By the way, that word vortex? It comes from the Latin word vortere, meaning to turn. It refers to the rapid movement of particles around an axis. In this case, the cold air that swirls counterclockwise around the North Pole. That same Latin root gives us many other English words, too, including introvert, meaning to turn inward, and diversify, with its roots adding up to the literal meaning to turn in different directions. Let's move on to blizzards. You've probably heard of a blizzard. That's a major snowstorm that lasts at least three hours and has sustained winds of 35 miles an hour or more. The blowing snow in a blizzard is so bad, you often can't see more than a quarter mile ahead. You might not have heard of a ground blizzard. That's when no new snow is falling, but high winds blow existing snow horizontally across the ground or vertically up in the air. Conditions in a ground blizzard can be just as bad as in a proper blizzard. Blizzard is a modern word. Its derivation is unknown, but it's thought to be an onomatopoeia, a word that attempts to capture the sound of something, similar to blow, blast, or bluster. It was first used in the early 1800s to mean a sharp blow or knock. By mid-century, the meaning had been extended to mean a furious blast of frost wind and blinding snow in which man and beast frequently perish. That poetic description, by the way, is from the Oxford English Dictionary. Now we'll talk about a few types of storms that are specific to the United States. First, there's the nor'easter, spelled N-O-R apostrophe E-A-S-T-E-R, nor apostrophe easter. Nor'easters mainly affect the northeastern United States, but that's not how they got their name. They have that name because their winds come from the northeast, off the Atlantic Ocean. Sailors have long identified storms by the direction of the approaching winds. Over time, they began calling these storm Northeasters and eventually shortened it to Nor'easter. Nor'easters usually occur in the winter, but they don't always bring snow. In fact, they often act more like hurricanes, bringing strong winds, heavy rains, and enormous waves. The most devastating nor'easter in recent memory was the so-called bomb cyclone that occurred in January 2018. It produced boot-covering snow from Maine to North Carolina and the highest tides seen in Boston since 1921. Oh, and the bomb cyclone refers to a storm in which the barometric pressure falls 24 millibars in 24 hours. Millibars are the unit scientists use to measure air pressure, by the way. The formation of such a storm? Naturally, it's called bombogenesis. Another storm unique to the United States is the Panhandle Hook. These are storms that build up in the Panhandle region of Texas and Oklahoma. They initially move east and then hook northeast toward the upper Midwest or Great Lakes region. The leading edge of the storm usually brings heavy snow. The trailing edge, thunderstorms. That's quite a combination. 
The panhandle, by the way, is the name for the rectangular portion of Texas that juts north at the top of the state. It's bordered by New Mexico on the west and Oklahoma on the north and east. And yes, it's called a panhandle because it's straight and narrow like the handle of a pan. The rest of Texas spreads out below it like the belly of a pan. I don't want to leave out our listeners in the Southern Hemisphere. There is snow there, I know. Antarctica, of course, is covered by snow and ice most of the year. The Tibetan Plateau, the Andes Mountains, and the Alps on the South Island of New Zealand also have some snow cover almost all year. Even South Africa sees snow. Just this past winter, we saw giraffes, elephant, and antelope wading through 25 centimeters or 10 inches of the white stuff. Let's wind up with a few fun words that you can drop into your winter conversations. Graupel is a word borrowed from German, meaning snow pellets or small hail. Gru is a nearly archaic word for thin, floating ice, like you might find on a river. Sastrogi is another word borrowed from German. It means the ridges formed on a snow surface by blowing wind. And cryology is the science of snow and ice itself. The root word of that cryo comes from the ancient Greek word kriosh, meaning frost and icy cold. We've also seen some fun but sort of made-up words over the past few years. Snowmageddon, snowpocalypse, thunder snow, and snow MG, a combination of snow and OMG. These are all examples of portmanteaus, words that combine two parts of other words to make something new. I hope all our listeners in the Northern Hemisphere stay warm. For those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, we'll try not to be jealous of your lack of gru, graupel, and panhandle hooks. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as dragonflyedit. And finally, it's time for some kitchen table lingo stories. If you'd like to call and share a story about a word that your family, and only your family, uses, leave a voicemail at 83-321-4-GIRL. Be sure to give me the reason your family uses the word or phrase, because that's usually the best part. Here's Rhonda's story. Hey, congrats on all the great news. This is paranormal and urban fantasy author Rhonda Del Baccia with a family-left story. We always call those nice rotini corkscrew pasta by a different name. We call them scroodles because it's a screwed up noodle. You'll never find it that way in the store. Thanks. And I have to share a cute one from the Grammar Girl Facebook group, too. Misha B. wrote, quote, My husband and I refer to any procrastinating task as writing our thank you cards which often looks like playing solitaire, watching TV, etc. It dates back to our wedding gift thank you cards that we were constantly procrastinating doing, unquote. And finally, a shout out to English underscore Robert on Instagram, a teacher who listens in Japan while riding his mountain bike. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. You can find me and all the other podcasters in my network at quickanddirtytips.com. And thanks to my audio producer, Nathan Sams. That's all, and thank you for listening. <laughs>